Please join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. Michelle Kine. Hi. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank Jennifer and the National Academy for inviting me to give a lecture tonight. It is really an honor. And I would like to thank all of you for coming out here 7 p.m. on a Wednesday evening to listen to a seminar. You could be at home having dinner or going to see the Avengers, but instead you decided to come out here to listen to me. So I want to preface this with I really don't want to waste your time. In the last 20 something years, I have estimated I have sat through well over a thousand lectures. Um, most of those I wish I had not had to sit through. <laughs> you get into the audience and it looks really awkward when you start trying to climb over somebody to get out. It's like you wish you had a remote so you could just flip channels. Um, and so it got me really thinking as to what um, there has been a handful of talks that I remember, some from 20 years ago, that have really shaped the work that I work on and has changed the trajectory of my research. And I really thought about what were the aspects of those talks that made them so impactful and so memorable. And so I came up with this list, um, key features of a talk that won't put me to sleep. One, it makes me think outside the box. I don't want to just, you know, word vomit the, my latest research to you guys. You guys can read my papers. If you guys want to take a deep dive into my research, my lab is down the block. Like, you guys can come over and we can do a deep dive. But I want to, um, you know, throw out some, some things to make you think a little bit um, and to, to question, you know, the way you think things operate. I like talks that inspire me. So I want to throw a little bit of that out there. Something that teach, uh, I like talks that teach me something new. And finally, I like talks that make me laugh. So I will be watching for your expressions. I will see how many of you nod off during the course of my <laughs> lecture to see how well I am doing. Um, I'm trying new material here because my husband has challenged me to um, go to a stand-up comedy gig to try my hand at stand-up comedy <laughs> because um, we think that that will improve my teaching um, ratings. So uh, I'm trying out some new material here today, so bear with me. The first point makes me think outside the box. So this is a picture of a clean room. I used to work in a clean room when I was in graduate school. We made these, um, so it's sort of like those Intel inside commercials where um, we made these really small chips. But instead of computer chips, we made these, they called them lab on a chips. And basically, it's to take what you would see in a traditional, um, oh, I have a pointer here, in a traditional wet lab, and to shrink all of the analysis onto a little chip. And so I spent my graduate career in a clean room, gowning up in these really uncomfortable suits and working in this box, making these types of chips. And I was very fortunate that my PhD work resulted in not just me graduating, but also starting a company. And so Flexion Biosciences is still around in South San Francisco, and they're still making these chips. And it really got me addicted to um, the startup environment. So I love doing startups. I'm working on a startup with my PhD student, Michael, right now. Um, that that's my fifth startup company. I think um, it's, uh, you know, I think to be a good engineer is to work on translating your ideas for real world, real world use. So that's something that's really important to me. So I caught the startup bug early when I was a graduate student. And um, I worked on the startup uh, for full time for about half a year. And then I got the opportunity. They told me it was a once in a lifetime opportunity to start at a brand new, to start a brand new university, to help be a founding faculty member at the brand new University of California. The University of California is comprised of 10 campuses. The very last campus ever slated to be opened was opened in 2005, right when I was graduating. Um, and the campus looked like this. <laughs> this is actually a picture that I took. <laughs> so they, it is a once in a lifetime opportunity because you would never want to do this twice. 
So I was used to working in these clean rooms <laughs> where I had all this equipment to make my tiny little chips. And I had none of that equipment to make any of my chips. And so after I, um, I stared at the cows for a while thinking that my career was over, I had to start getting a little resourceful. I had to figure out how I could make these tiny chips, um, typically using clean room, you know, uh, in a clean room environment, how it could make that without any sort of infrastructure. And so the idea behind those clean rooms is that they have very fancy equipment to try to pattern down to very high resolution. So this is top-down patterning. And you want to get down, in, in the case of the microsystems that I was working on at the time, you want to get down to the, you know, to the micron level. And so you need to focus light um, and use all of this expensive equipment to do so. So I didn't have any of that at my disposal. And so one night, I came up with this idea. And it was motivated by my favorite children's toy. So um, I thought, well, what if I patterned everything at the large scale, which is inexpensive and easy to do, and then shrink everything down afterwards? And so I don't know how many of you are familiar with the children's toy Shrinky Dinks. Shrinky Dinks, some of you. So my students have no idea what Shrinky Dinks were, right? They're way too young for this. I tell them it's like transparencies, you know, the overhead projectors. They're like, what's an overhead projector? <laughs> so, um, so Shrinky Dinks. So I found this video oops, of Shrinky Dinks. So the idea behind them is that the, or, these are pre-stressed thermoplastic sheets. They're pre-stressed um, polystyrene sheets. And you stick them in an oven, and they shrink to a fraction of their size uh, in literally three minutes. And so I thought, well, all I needed to do instead of patterning at very high resolution was pattern coarsely and then shrink everything down afterwards to make the microchips that I wanted to make. And so I tested it out in my lab uh, that night. And the next morning, I ran into lab. I didn't have any graduate students at the time. I was a new assistant professor at UC Merced. And I told my students I was so excited. And my student did not want to publish on it. He said, people were going to laugh at us. And I said, probably, um, but I didn't care. I said, I'm going to submit this to the best journal in my field, and we're going to see what happens. And so I submitted it to the Royal Society of Chemistry lab on a chip. I called it Shrinky Dink Microfluidics. And the paper went viral. So <laughs> the CEO of Shrinky Dinks called the editor of Lab on a Chip asking why all of these labs were buying boxes and boxes of Shrinky Dinks. <laughs> And it turns out that the problem that I was having at this brand new university was also the problem that lots of startup companies and you know, not so well-to-do universities that didn't have clean room access were also suffering from. So um, we happened upon this, and it really felt like you know, a nerd version of a Cinderella story. I got a job offer in 2009 to come to UC Irvine, and um, we had all of these accolades. We were getting picked up by, by the popular press. Um, so things, things were really good. And to this day, it remains the workhorse in my lab. So the idea behind this, you can watch the word shrink, shrink. And we have a um, so, Shrink wrap film actually shrinks a little bit more. So you can see how small that shrinks. It shrinks down to, uh, it shrinks down by, you know, 20 times. So um, we use this to deposit various materials. So we can deposit, now we can make incompatible with very expensive equipment and standard photolithography. And you can even um, get past Rayleigh's criteria. So you um, limit of uh, resolution. So you can pattern metals. Um, my, uh, my graduate student, Amanda, is putting down carbon nanotubes. You can make it compatible with standard photolithography. You can do surface modifications. You can do all these different things with it um, to, for various applications. And I'm going to talk about some of the applications um, that we've been pursuing over the last couple of years. The first thing that we thought was really cool that you could do with this is if you pattern on it, if you put a stiffer material on top of it, like a metal, right? the metal can't shrink. So it buckles. And if you can control the buckling by the thickness of the metal and the stiffness of the metal, then you can control the wrinkles that they create. And depending on the size of the wrinkles, you can do some very 
interesting things. So you can do uh, near field surface enhanced sensing. So you can um, leverage the electromagnetic field when you, for example, shine a laser at the surface to get um, enhanced fluorescent signals. So we've demonstrated that you can get multi-thousand fold enhancements in the fluorescent signal of a biomolecule that you put near these surfaces um, based on surface enhanced fluorescence. You can do um, uh, surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy. Um, we were more interested in doing um, diagnostics that were very low cost. We wanted to be able to make chips that only cost pennies that you could bring out to the developing world. And so we made these diagnostics. We just put um, silica which uh, on the surface. And so these are far field enhancements. The fact that you're shrinking everything, you're getting um, this concentration of those molecules to come closer together. Plus we put this glassy, the silica, this glassy substrate underneath and we got um, all of this additional enhancement off of the, the wrinkling of the glass. So um, we've published on this and we show we can attach biomolecules to it and you can get enhanced signal to noise ratios with this. And so it was all pretty exciting. Um, we ended up getting a bunch of covers, which is what you want to get when you're an academic. Uh, so we got a bunch of covers for our articles, and things were good. I got tenure. Um, you know, life felt pretty good. But as any academic uh, knows, uh, academics are, um, you know, they get restless really, really easily. So there, there was more to the story, right? It was really cool that we could do low cost diagnostics and we were getting pretty papers, but something still didn't sit right with me. And so you get to the second part, something that inspires me. So the average new car, this doesn't look like any type of a fancy car or anything. But the average new car has 60 to 100 sensors built into it, right? Everything from the, the tire pressure in your car to, um, you know, whether, you know, I, and I use this all the time, is, you know, whether I'm going to hit somebody when I park. Um, there's a lot of sensors going on, right? You don't wait until your car is blowing up at the side of the road to get it maintained. It tells you every time something is going wrong now if you buy a new car nowadays. The average new person has zero sensors, right? <laughs> Which may seem par for the course, but what's your comparison between a car, the average car, and the average person? So the average American keeps their car for six years. The average person keeps their car, their body, for 78.7 years. That's you and me. At, this little girl is going to live well beyond 100 years old. My kids and she are going to make it past 100 easily. Um, average number of miles, 110,000 for a car. Average number of miles a person walks in his lifetime for 78 years is actually 110,000 miles. Walks. I calculated the number of revolutions the engine would actually run um, during this time. Um, and the number of breaths a person takes, which is actually more than the number of, of revolutions, right? And then the number of heartbeats is even more than that, right? Two billion heartbeats in a lifetime. And the most remarkable thing about this is if you miss just a couple of either your breaths or your beats of your heart, it's game over, right? There's no calling AAA. <laughs> <laughs> and so this really hit home to me when my baby was born one year ago, and he, I had a scheduled C-section, and he aspirated on some amniotic fluid, and apparently, the doctors told me this was really common, um, they handed me my baby, he didn't cry or anything, this is my second baby, so I said, well, that's kind of unusual. They said, nothing to worry about. It's like, he's blue. They said, nothing to worry about. <laughs> For several hours, literally, I'm like, he's blue, and they're like, no, you know, you're drugged up, he's fine. Um, and so one nurse finally listened to me, and then they rushed him to the NICU where he was there for the next eight days. He aspirated on amniotic fluid, and he had a collapsed lung, and the standard of care, there is no way to actually measure um, respiration easily. You can measure respiration rate based off of the EKGs that they put on him. You can put a pulse ox on to tell you if he has enough oxygen, but by the time your baby doesn't have enough oxygen, that's pretty late in terms of whether they're breathing, breathing well or not. And so um, 
there was no way to get things like minute ventilation or flow data from him. Fortunately, the story has a happy ending. He turned a year old um, two weeks ago. <laughs> um, but it really um, inspired me that we need to end symptom-based uh, symptom reactionary medicine. Uh, and and we, we do it all the time today. Uh, you know, my, my older child, who's two and a half, on Saturday, uh, he was running a low-grade fever. A doctor said, bring him into the office. Brought him into the office. Of course, he didn't have a fever when we brought him into the doctor's office. Doctor said, I'm overreacting. Take him home. Then his fever spiked to 105. Um, so I tried to call the doctor, but then he wasn't available to take my call. So I rushed him to urgent care. Urgent care told me to take my baby out of there. They couldn't see him because he was going to seize any minute. I needed to rush him to the ER. Bringing him into the ER, and of course he throws up all over me, so that's a very dramatic way to enter the ER. So we got seen immediately. <laughs> but we need to end the symptom-based reactionary approach to medicine, right? Physiological changes precede clinical deterioration. We can measure these subtle changes in the body before something catastrophic happens, right? Where's our check engine light? And so that's what my lab's been working on. So I come up with the crazy ideas. My students here actually figure out how to make it happen. Um, and so we've been working for the last couple of years on developing these mechanical sensors to actually measure important physiological parameters. And the way we do that is using the shrink and ink approach. I talked already about these wrinkles that we were, we were creating in the shrinking inks. It turns out my students have figured out a really clever way to actually take the wrinkles back off and put them into other materials. And so if you put them into other materials, you can make them very stretchy. And so they stretch with the body. And the neat thing about this is that if you think about a thin metal film on a polymer, you would think it would just snap as soon as you pull it, right? But the fact that it has all of these wrinkles, it has a lot of strain relief, so it acts like an accordion. So if you stretch it out, it stretches really far, and it also has really exquisite electrical properties. So it's got a very good response time, and we can tailor it to either be very sensitive to strain or not sensitive at all, depending on the materials and the thickness that we put down. And so we have a project right now to actually develop this into uh, an asthma monitor. Because just like you know, I had all of these concerns over whether my child was breathing or not, asthma is actually the number one chronic disease in children. And um, over 3,000 people a year die from asthma attacks. Um, there's currently nothing on the market to uh, detect, much less predict, whether an asthmatic attack is coming. And the symptoms, we know about the symptoms, right? It's difficulty breathing, it's coughing, it's wheezing, uh, it's shortness of breath, because this is all signaling to you that your airways are undergoing changes um, because it's being stimulated by an allergen or some sort of environmental trigger. But the standard of care nowadays is to uh, give a kid a peak flow meter at home, and they're supposed to breathe into it twice a day, and you're supposed to, as a parent, mark down the volume that they can maximally exhale out twice a day. And over the course of 40 days, you're supposed to be able to discern some sort of pattern with how they're breathing to be able to say, OK, well, maybe my child's breathing is going to be OK. This is obviously very difficult for an asthmatic child to be able to breathe maximally. It's highly variable. It's hard to control. And it's manual. So you have to actually make your kid breathe into this twice a day. My very talented graduate student, Michael, I'm going to put him on a spot here. Uh, raise your hand, Michael. He actually has the sensor on him. Uh, so you can watch his breathing, and it probably went a lot faster when I called on him. Uh, uh, he developed this sensor. It's a wireless sensor here that pushes all this information to his phone or a tablet. He actually has on his tablet right now, so you can see his breathing patterns. So you could do continuous respiratory monitoring. And uh, using what's already in your phone, we wanted to create like a real-time ways for asthma detection. So if you know all of these other kids are having attacks in a certain area, you know not to take your kid to that area if that your child is also allergic to those same allergens. The neat thing about this is it can also tell you how your child is doing after you give them the inhaler, for example. So you can actually have a closed 
closed loop solution to how the drug is at, your child is actually responding to the drug. And so Michael published um, just a couple of weeks ago a very nice paper comparing um, his little respiratory sensor to medical grade spirometry. So this is, if you go to a pulmonologist's office, this is what they would make you do to um, see how your flow is. And so um, you, uh, the, the red line here is the, the volume um, from the, from the um, spirometer. And we have a sensor on the uh, rib cage and one on the abdomen. And then he also uh, came up with a nice model to combine them. Uh, and we get very nice R squared values comparing our uh, little disposable sensors to medical grade spirometry. So um, we can get volume information out of this, which would have been really helpful uh, you know, in the hospital for my son. We can also get rate information, which is a little bit easier to do. There are some products on the market out there that can do um, respiration rate. Uh, we can do respiration rate quite well. It matches, um, uh, it, it matches the uh, gold standards very well. And so Michael got a little bit of press uh, and publicity around his paper when it was recently published. We are working with um, a clinic up at UCLA to, um, to stimulate asthmatic attacks so we can actually see if we can pick it up before symptoms become very apparent. Apparently, it's not very, um, it's, it's difficult to get an IRB approved to stimulate an asthma attack. Um, so we're doing that up at UCLA with some clinicians who do that on a regular basis. But Michael's simulated asthma, asthma attacks actually um, show that we are picking up um, the waveform that you would expect from restricted flow where the exhalation looks um, different and drawn out. And that's very indicative of a typical uh, asthmatic attack. And so that's, this project is, um, is very exciting and promising and Michael is uh, graduating soon and we're working on spinning that out into a company. Um, the other project that we're working on that I think is really exciting is taking um, a look at blood pressure monitoring. All of you are very familiar, I'm sure, with the arm cuff to take your blood pressure measurements. Um, and you get one systolic value and one diastolic value, right? You go to Walgreens, you go to the doctor's office, they take a systolic value and they take a diastolic value. Um, cardiovascular disease is, you know, the number one killer in the U.S. And, you know, more than half of Americans have high blood pressure. Um, so everybody is aware of taking blood pressure measurements. What people might not be so aware of is that your blood pressure is not a static two numbers, right? You don't just get one systolic value and one diastolic value. It fluctuates a lot. It fluctuates throughout the day, and it's supposed to fluctuate a lot. Um, but this variability, this beat-to-beat -beat variability, is actually prognost a prognostic of cardiovascular morbidity, independent of hypertension. Um, it's also prognostic of other diseases, including dementia and Alzheimer's, because a lot of those have underlying small vessel disease um, causes. And current blood pressure measurements are actually inadequate to do that because it gives you a static systolic and a static diastolic value. If you want to do continuous blood pressure measurements, the gold standard is to do an arterial line like you would do in the ICU. Um, the problem with this is that it is invasive. You actually have to put a catheter into your arm, and so you obviously can't be mobile to do that. Um, so this is what your waveform actually looks like, and that's how you would actually extract your your systolic and your diastolic values. There are some uh, technologies that are available on the market to do continuous blood pressure monitoring, but these are typically used in the NICU still because any movement obscures the signal completely because it's based on photoplasmography, so PPG sensors. Um, so as I mentioned, this is, um, B2B blood pressure variability, there's a ton of papers coming out over the last few years talking about how blood pressure normally um, varies with circadian ry rhythms, and differences from that is prognostic of um, various cardiovascular outcomes as well as cognitive decline. Um, so we've been working in our lab on developing these same types of you know, small um, conformal sensors um, 
this one we put on anywhere that you can feel a pulse. So we uh, can put it on the radial artery, we can put it on a temporal artery. The advantage of this is that um, it's lightweight, it's informative, and it's accurate. So we just published this paper. It came out um, five days ago, showing that compared with um, the um, one, the other type of continuous blood pressure monitor on the market that's used in the NICU, um, it's based on voltage clamp methods. We compared ours against theirs, and we got um, very, very high correlations between the two in healthy subjects. And so, um, this, you know, it's within um, ISO standards. Um, compared to uh, the other technology. So we think this is really promising. We have to take this with a grain of salt because this was done in healthy subjects. This was all done with graduate students who have very nice blood pressures. Um, <laughs> but um, we have an ongoing study where two of my students actually have been measuring on congestive heart failure patients. So congestive heart failure patients affect um, almost six million uh, Americans, and um, you typically get congestive heart failure after you have a cardiac infarct. Um, and scarily, more than half of those who develop congestive heart failure die within five years of diagnosis. And the earlier you can catch congestive heart failure, the, um, the easier it is to treat. So you, a lot of the devices on the market actually wait to look for changes in fluid levels when you gain weight, um, when you have this edema. It's very hard to treat, and that kind of signals when you start having to be hospitalized. And so we're looking for these early on changes in hemodynamic um, parameters that actually signal that somebody is getting worse. And my very talented grad student, Sophia, actually pulled out two parameters that she could distinguish between healthy subjects and CHF subjects, and she could actually even bin it between the severity of the CHF patient. Um, the data is still very preliminary and she hasn't published on that yet, so I'm not sharing any of that data with you tonight, but um, stay tuned for that story. I think that there's gonna be some very interesting things that we can do with congestive heart failure patients that we're working on. Um, We've been talking about you know, mechanical types of sensors up to now, the respiratory and the blood pressure sensor. Um, Complementing that, right? we want to start getting at biomarkers for different diseases to figure out when you're stressed, what's actually going on um, in your sweat. And so Amanda is visiting 40 year from Brazil. She's a very talented graduate student, and she's been developing these, um, uh, these sensors into electrochemical sensors. And she showed that she can actually retain all of the surface area from the unshrunk into the transferred piece. Um, so when she actually does her um, analysis, her electrochemical analysis, she can actually get very high, highly sensitive sensors. And so the idea behind this is that these biomolecules are available in very low concentrations in your sweat, which is why typically you take biomolecules from your blood or from your urine, but it's very difficult to get it from sweat. But if we actually have all this extra surface area to work with, that we can actually capture enough of the biomolecules to get a robust enough signal. And so that's a relatively recent project, but I think it complements the other projects um, that we've been working on quite nicely. And so um, the last, I guess the next point that I wanted to, to touch upon today to keep you guys awake, looking out to see how many, I, feel, I see a couple of people falling asleep. <laughs> um, in, my, in my class, I just called them out. I was like, you're falling asleep. Uh, teaches me something new. So you would never have guessed it if you look at the composition of my lab, but this, these numbers are actually quite staggering to me. Only 14% of working engineers today are women. Only 15% of inventors are women. 13% of high tech and, and health tech um, CEOs are women. And um, I was surprised when I found out that only 5% of engineering full professors are women. So there's this huge discrepancy between, um, in, in terms of gender uh, issues, in getting more women to go into engineering. And I would argue that getting more women into engineering is just good for humankind. Um, and so one of the things that I've been really focused on over the last 
few years is to try to figure out why my lab is more than half women now. Um, and so I think one of the issues with this is that we need to debunk the myth that science and engineering is uncreative or boring. The way we teach science in school, we try to have students get to the right answer in the back of the book, but that's not the way we do science in our labs, right? It's not, you know, you think of a scientist and they're isolated at their bench and there's these, you know, they're an island, but that's not the way, we do team science. Everybody works in teams, it's highly collaborative, it's very social, there's a lot of communication going on. Um, this is my shameless plug for a documentary that my lab was featured in recently. And they talked about, um, we were asked pointedly whether science was creative. And it, it has to be creative, right? Because if you thought the same way everyone else thinks, then science would never move forward. There is no right answer to what we're looking for. I'm wrong most of the time, as my students would probably tell you. My husband definitely tells me that all the time. <laughs> he tells me that I am, um, most of my ideas are really, he said 85 to 90% of my ideas are just horrible. Um, but I have so many ideas um, that, you know, my numbers don't come out to be so bad. And I actually pursue a lot of those ideas, right? So, and I think that's the key. We, we teach our girls to be perfectionists, that they can't try and fail at something. And that's, that was the impetus for my title of this talk, Play Science. We play sports. We play music. Why don't we play science? Why isn't it okay to just tinker and to be wrong? Um, and so with that inspiration, um, anybody, you guys must know who this is, this crowd. Feynman. So in 1959, he gave this talk, um, there's plenty of room at the bottom, that heralded the coming of nanotechnology. So Richard Feynman is arguably the most famous physicist. Um, maybe second most famous after Einstein, right? Um, and he said, what if you can make something that can make something smaller, that can make something smaller? Imagine the power of a hundred tiny hands. And so I really love that. I thought that was, I actually wrote a paper to applied physics letter where we actually did that. We did the serial shrinking and I tried to call it a hundred tiny hands, but the title got rejected from the journal. The paper got accepted. Um, but I really love that line because I figure, you know, I could maybe squeak out a few more companies in my lifetime, but my impact is limited. But if I could actually help some of my students become inventors, then we could really start making a difference in this world. And so I challenged my students a couple of years ago that if I, quote unquote, helped to invent them, how could they pay this forward and start helping to invent enter? invent other inventors at a young age. And so we started this program called 100 Tiny Hands, where we wrote comic books and we made toys to teach science the way we actually do science in lab, right? There's no right answer that you're trying to get at, but it's gotta be fun and it's creative and it's all about exploring instead of getting at a particular right answer. And it's working in groups and so, Michael, along with a lot of my other students, do a ton of outreach in the communities and through schools and after school programs, working with these kids, with these, um, with these kids to teach fundamental science principles um, in a fun way. So we have them, for example, here in our supervision kit, they make their own lenses that they attach to a smartphone or a tablet, and then they look for different things. And there's this little story that goes along with it. This is my graduate student, Julie, who invented the box. Um, she's graduated now, but she is trying to figure out who her secret admirer is. So she takes the fingerprints of all the boys in the class and she figures it out. Um, and so we wanted to create this community of inventors by having them uh, play science. And so the, the newest addition to our collection is Riley the Tiny Explorer. And we're trying to um, get at children even younger. So um, my very talented uh, undergraduates, Jamie and Sabrina, came up with this cute little book where uh, Kenny the Caterpillar and Riley get stuck in their little tree house and they're trying because it rained and they have to get across the moat. So they have to build a boat and they have to learn why things float. Um, and so um, we have just finished the 
the beta version of this book. We're looking for beta readers. Um, if you guys are interested in helping us beta read, if you want to email us at 100tinyhands at gmail.com, we'd love to send you a book. We'd love your feedback. Um, any ideas? We're new to publishing, but you know, we were new to, blue, um, to blood pressure measurements you know, a year ago. So uh, you know, one of the things to being creative is pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone. And so that's what we're trying to do. Um, and so we'd love your feedback on the book. Um, and so I think I went through my slides really, really quickly. Um, but my ceiling gets to be the next generation's floor, and that is a great honor. That was um, a quote by uh, Kelly Cluck, who's actually a snowboarder. But I love that quote because I really think that sums up um, my work as an academic. And so I hoped I touched on the different aspects to a fun talk. I did hear a few people laugh. You could be brutally honest if you don't think I have a career in stand-up. Um, but with that, we do have sensors. I can pass around my little sensors so you can see them. Um, I would love to open it up for questions. I'll pass around my sensors.